So at the end of the last lecture, we've gotten to Edwards edition. And well, let me highlight here that this is Edwards edition over the reals. So we're looking at something where we can make arguments about something being less than zero. And we've shown that this is a nice group law that it's, well, doesn't have any exceptional cases, assuming that we've chosen D to be a negative number. And well, there are some things which are left to the computer, but assume that you have done this already, then you have seen that this is a nice commutative group law. But in cryptography, we want to talk about curves over fine fields. We want to be careful not to have any, uh, any growth giving away information. We have seen in the clock group, for instance, that um, we could infer from the size of the denominators what scalar Alice or Bob has been putting in there. So we do want to look at curves over the fine field FP. Happy to restrict to prime fields, but we cannot argue about well, what we did in the proof, namely that x squared plus y squared is zero. We are using that squares are always positive, and well, since coordinates are zero, uh, larger than zero, their squares are larger than zero. This is meaningless modulo p. If you have p equals, say, 7, and you're talking about the number minus 3, then minus 3 is the same as plus 4. Numbers can just wrap around mod 7, or do wrap around mod 7. So you cannot argue that something is less than 0 or larger than 0. So we need a replacement for the proof, and we also need to figure out what condition we actually have, what condition we need to have as a replacement for not d not being 0, assuming that there is one. Now, what you'll see in this proof is several steps that are sort of hard to motivate, and the best argument I can give if you ask me, hey, why you do this, is it works. But I can give you some more background information. So back in 2007, when we were exploring Edwards curves, um, we were surprised to notice already for the reals that there were no exceptional cases. And then we're looking at the same thing for fine fields, and like, well, what can we use as the equivalent of something not being well, of something being negative. What is happening there? Now, over the reals, the interesting thing about negative numbers is that you can't compute square roots of them. If you take a negative number and you compute the square root, you end up in the complex numbers. So that was the well, closest thing we could come up with, so maybe it matters that d is not a square. And you'll see a whole lot of squares appearing on this page, and we're aiming towards showing that if anything could go wrong, then d would be a square. So then we can argue that if we have d being a non-square, it's a safe choice. Also remember that if you're in a fine field, well, you have a cyclic group in the multiplicative group. So that means if you take the integers mod p, you exclude 0, so that's the multiplicative group, then every second of those numbers is a square. So squares are very, very common in the integers mod p. Over the reals, well, every number that's positive is a square, every number that's negative is non-square, but if you look over the integers, then squares are kind of sparse. They never happen, essentially. Okay, well, there's 4 and there's 9, but you see that they're stretching away quite a lot. Over integers mod p, every second number, well, on average, it's not that 1 is, 2 is not, 3 is, but if you're taking all the p minus 1 non-zero numbers, then there are p minus 1 over 2 squares and p minus 1 over 2 non-squares. All right, let's jump right in. So let's assume we're in a bad case. So let's assume our denominators vanish. And I'm writing here again what the denominators look like. So it's 1 plus or minus the d, which is the curve parameter, and the x1, y2, uh, x1, x2, y1, y2. And we're assuming that we're talking about curve points. So, I mean, of course, those could vanish for arbitrary inputs, but we're only going to put in points that are on the curve. So if we are in a bad case, then let's call this, this thing on the right here, let's call this epsilon, and, well, things go bad if epsilon is zero, uh, if epsilon is plus or minus one, because then this whole thing would be zero. Now, if epsilon, which is the product of these numbers, is plus or minus one, then in particular, none of the factors is zero. I'm going to use this repeatedly further down this proof. And now we start with, well, there are going to be two parts to this proof, and neither of them is very intuitive. But we're going to use lots of squares so that afterwards, well, d is not going to be in the square and everything else should be a square. 
Okay, so we start with something which um, looks like the left hand, uh, the right hand side of the equation, namely this part for the first point, and this part here for the second point. Well, and all we're doing is we flip it to be the second part. So we're flipping for the point two, we're flipping from here to there, and now we have yet another equation. Okay, now we expand this thing, and on the right hand side, we're now seeing a d squared, x1 squared, y1 squared, x2 squared, y2 squared. Oh, this should look very familiar because this is the expression here and oh, I put this out as epsilon. So what we have here is actually epsilon squared. Okay, so that's epsilon squared. And remember, we're looking for bad cases. So we're assuming that epsilon is plus or minus one. So epsilon squared is plus one. I'm flipping the order here, so the epsilon goes here, this one goes there, to make this look more like the right-hand side of the curve equation for the first point, and I'm going to replace this by the left-hand side. Okay, so one, certainly true, you could confirm every step, you can hang on, nothing is particularly complicated, but why? Well, again, because it works. And here is another one which looks even worse. We're going to take x1 plus y1 epsilon and square that. We're going to use the, sec by, the first binomial formula. We're getting this expansion here. We're now going to use what I have proven here, namely that I can replace x1 squared with y1 squared by this expression. So that's what's going on over here. I'm going This one goes here. And I'm also replacing epsilon from up here and there. So we have 2x1, y1, and then d x1, x2, y1, y2. That's here. And then you observe that each term, well, kind of obvious for this one, has a d x1 squared y1 squared, but also here we have a d, there are two x1s and there are two y1s. So we can take those outside the parentheses. And then inside the parentheses, okay, well, we have those guys already inside. And then what's left from the second term here is just two x2 y2. Ah, that one. And that one should recognize again as the first binomial formula. So what we have there is inside the parentheses is just x2 plus y2 and the whole thing squared. And now we're seemingly almost there. We have a square on the left. We have d times a square on the right. And we want to prove that if anything goes wrong, then d must be a square. Okay, so we just want to divide by this thing here, and then we have d sitting alone being a fraction of squares. But watch out when you're dividing, you have to watch out not to divide by zero. Um, we do know that those two guys are not zero. That was up here already, that none of the coordinates is zero. But it could happen that x2 plus y2 is zero. Let's first assume it's non-zero. Then we're getting d as a fraction and then the whole thing squared. So that means that in that case, if anything goes wrong, d is not a square, uh, that d is a square. So, okay, that's pretty good. Now we want to get to, well, what happens if x2 plus y2 happens to be zero? We could now do the same proof again. We plug in a minus sign here, and then we trace this minus sign through all the steps. So this minus sign, Here's a minus sign. I'll remember this got here. And then all that happens would be a minus sign here. And so then again, we have a square equals d times a square. And we can divide by the square here if it's non-zero. Well, now we have the condition that x2 minus y2 must be non-zero. Well, in that case, we again get that d is a square. Well, now what happens in case that both of them are zero? so that the sum and the difference of them is zero. But if those are both zero, then we can add them up and we're getting two, x2 is zero, so x2 is zero, or we can take the difference and we're getting that two x2, uh, y2 is zero, meaning that x2 and y2 are zero, which we had excluded up here. Okay, so this third case can't happen. And in the other two cases, um, d is a square, and we now have a complete case distinction because, well, it's either there or there or there. 
Okay, so if d is not a square, we do not have any exceptions. If d happens to be a square, well, it's still a very special arrangement that you must hit. But there, for each x1, y1, you can find an x2, y2 so that things fail. But if d is not a square, things cannot fail. Okay, so now we can write out what it means to look at Edwards curves mod p. So we're choosing an out prime p and we're choosing a non-square d in this fine field. And then e sub d, which is this equation, so y, x squared plus y squared is 1 plus d x squared y squared, that is called a complete Edwards curve. So complete here means that there are no exceptions. If you ignore the conditions that d is not a square, then it's called an Edwards curve. But for cryptography, we do like to have complete Edwards curves. If you look at all the points that are on this curve, so if we plug in, well, let's say we plug in x and ask me, hey, is there a y? Everything is very symmetric. So if you have an x coordinate that gives a y, you also have x and then minus y, and you also have minus x and y, and you have minus x and minus y. So you're getting four points for every point that you're finding, with some exceptions. For instance, you're still having the neutral element, or well, point of order one, at 12 o'clock point and now while looking at the circle where we bumped in the edges a little bit um, that one well it looks like a starfish so we usually talk about the Edward starfish so we're looking at the head of the starfish that's the neutral element we're looking at the feet of the starfish that's the point of order two and we're looking at the arms of a starfish those continue to have order four and then all other points you have this nice symmetry that I just mentioned if you have an x and y you also have plus minus x plus minus y and you can even flip them over, you're getting plus minus y and plus minus x. So there are also some points which, under this last operation, do not change. Points of the form where the absolute value of the x coordinate is the same as the absolute value of the y coordinate. If those points exist, and they need not exist, it depends on what d you've chosen, then those points have order 8. So that's one of the exercises you'll see next. You can actually prove that those points of order 8. You can see that they double to point of order 4. Okay, so what happens if you choose d that happens to be a square? Well, you must still avoid 0 because else you're back to the circle. That's not an elliptic curve. You also must avoid d being 1. That's the same as over the reals. You would get these lines at plus and minus 1 and the vertical lines at plus and minus 1. Uh, okay, now over fp, those are dotted dotted lines, not, not continuous lines, but it would not be an elliptic curve. All other cases are still elliptic, and for most inputs, for most input pairs, you still get a valid addition, but you have failure cases. So for a math proof that this is still a group, you can always find a way around. So for those exceptional cases, you can say, oh, if I'm in this case and some other expression is non-zero, and so we now have two addition laws that overlap everywhere and then well almost everywhere except for these two exceptions and we have but we're in crypto and in crypto you're always dealing with kind of an adversarial environment let's assume that you're doing address curves for a web server or you're doing address curves for a smart card and then the smart card might get in the hands of the attacker and they will figure out what implementation you have on there and if your implementation has failure cases they're going to poke around. Attackers often try to exploit such failure cases. And so doing a safe implementation, if there is a failure case, is a lot more complicated. What I just said, well, you would need to implement two addition laws, and you must make sure to pick the right one in the right moment. And maybe they can poke you and get you on the wrong one. So since you are probably the person who's designing this system, you should make yourself the job easy and you should pick a non-square. There is no benefit of picking a square. Pick a non-square so that you have a nice addition. We also wanted to have slightly more generality, so we defined twisted Edwards curves. So twisted Edwards curves look pretty much like Edwards curves except for there's an extra parameter a. Here in front of the x square there's an a and then if you look at the addition law that's essentially the same except for there's now also some e which has been uh, a which has been sneaking in here okay so 
what are the conditions? Before we had the condition that d must not be a square. And well, okay, if you allow squares, if you don't go for completeness, you definitely must exclude 0 and 1. Now we have the situation, again, we want odd prime fields, and our a and d must both be non-zero. So we do want to have a non-zero x squared term, we want to have a non-zero x squared y squared term. And we also ensure that a and d are not the same. So this thing is called a twisted Edwards curve. And if you're looking at this addition formula and you're going through the cases again, you can prove that it's complete, so there are no exceptional cases, exactly if a is a square and d is not a square. Well, that's kind of nice because, well, the Edwards case is included as a equals 1, which is definitely a square, and so it, it nicely simplifies to that case. Um, if you're looking for the special po points that we know and like, we still have the head and the feet of the starfish, so you still have the 0, 1 and 0, minus 1 point, but you need not find points at the hand of the starfish. So you need not have points, well, it used to be plus minus 1, 0. It would now be square root of a, well, plus or minus square root of a, comma, 0. And those, well, need not exist. Now, if a is a square, you still have points there, but your starfish could be stretched out or squished more. You will still get that the group order is divisible by 4, if I, well, if I relax the completeness condition, then you might not encounter points of order 4, but you would still have that the group order is divisible by 4. So that tells you that there are more points of order 2. And think of the pictures that I've shown you last time. Well, now it would be still the starfish, but if the hands stretch out to infinity, you would have exceptional cases there. So those would be points of order 2 at infinity. And similarly, you could have uh, transformations in other directions. Let me also talk a little bit of the history. So if you open a textbook on elliptic curves, well, there's, I think, one that I'm aware of, which does Edwards curves. Everything else is just doing Weierstrass curves. And in the sixth lecture, uh, in the fifth lecture, I'm going to show you Weierstrass curves because everybody must have seen it. But I very much prefer the Edwards approach because it's, it's friendlier. You actually, well, can prove something and you can understand something. But it's a fairly new approach. You can't blame the textbooks for not having it. Um, the history goes a lot longer back. It goes back to Euler. So we're looking at something which is like 1700s. And so um, Euler in, well, in Latin of all places, um, was talking about arc lengths of ellipses. And that's also where the term of elliptic curves comes from. And so in this picture on the right, I've been highlighting in red, like putting a little box around it. He's looking at the formula of, of this shape. And that actually matches what we now call Edwards curves, namely the form x squared plus y squared equals 1 plus n square, uh, n x squared y squared. So there is the same addition law that we have. Well, the, sorry, there is the same uh, operation. And uh, Euler actually did get into uh, computing a few multiples on this curve. So he has formulas for doubling, tripling, quadrupling, and so on. So he doesn't have a general addition law, he has a point, and he computes multiples of this point. A bit later, Gauss, actually posthumously, has a general addition formula for the same curve, well, okay, written in a little bit different form. So this would be um, our x squared, y squared, and then 1 minus this term. So he's going for the special case of d equals minus 1. But he's, um, for those, coming up with general addition formulas. And remember, for the clock group, we ran via sine and cosine. So he's now defining a sine for sinus lambda scartus and cosinus lambda scartus here um, for these special additions on this different curve shape. And he gets, um, well, what looks very much like the Edwards curve addition formulas in the special case of d being minus 1. Now, Edwards, you're looking like, okay, Gauss is 1755. Um, so Edwards, well, that paper, the color picture here, is just from 2007. So Edwards proved that every elliptic curve, and we're going to see next lecture what it means to be an elliptic curve, every elliptic curve can be written in this form. Now, this looks almost like what I told you what an Edwards curve is. Um, he is allowing himself to have field extensions. So when he looks at R, he's also looking at C. 
or when he's looking at the rational numbers, he's also uh, including square root of two or square root of so, something else. Um, we wanted to include, well, the special case that Gauss and Euler were looking at, and well, you would need to have a being square root of minus one in order to get a minus one in there. And so we moved from the a squared on the outside to a d without a square on the inside. But all the theory, all the ideas come from Harold Edwards from this paper. Well, Dan Bernstein and I took it and brought it to crypto and we're like, hey, this is the most awesome addition law you can think of and also have been running around teaching a whole bunch of people. Well, so to close today's lecture, Edwards curves are really, really cool.